please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Richard Heinberg. We all seem to want more. We have more than our grandparents did. We expect our children to have more than we have. But is that realistic? Let's take a, a, a little trip back in recent history and find out. First of all, throughout the last couple of thousand years, economies actually haven't changed that much until just recently. For most people, even though empires were rising and falling, for most people, daily life was a matter of hewing wood, drawing water, planting, harvesting, tending the chickens, until the last couple of hundred years. Then something really changes. Well, what was it? It had a lot to do with energy. See, it's energy that enables us to do things. And throughout most of history, the energy sources at our disposal were renewable sources like field crops, firewood, and, and we exerted energy into our environment to get the things we needed by way of muscle power. Now these are limited energy sources, so there was only so much we could do. That changed with the fossil fuel revolution of the last couple of hundred years. Suddenly we had access to sources of energy that were cheap and concentrated, in the case of oil, highly portable. These energy sources enabled us to do things unimaginable previously. Think about it this way. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car, having to push your car, let's say, 10 feet off to the side of the road. Okay, now imagine pushing your car 30 miles. How much work is that? Well, it's a lot. It's maybe eight weeks of hard labor but we get that done for us, having our car push 30 miles by a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying four bucks and complaining. <laughs> so think about that. Eight weeks of hard labor energy equivalents for four dollars? That is cheap energy, and that's what has led us to mechanize every process of production and transport that we possibly could over the past couple of hundred years, and that's what gave us more. But we had to adjust to having so much more. See, in the early days, one of the biggest problems was overproduction. With cheap energy and powered assembly lines, we could make stuff in greater quantities and faster than people were accustomed to buying it, or even wanting it. So we solved that problem with advertising. <laughs> Advertisers regard the human psyche <laughs> as a blank slate on which to project the images of consumerism, okay? The fantasies of consumerism. Also, we invented <clears throat> The, the practice of making our products so that they would reliably break down over a short period of time or change their appearance every year or two so that everybody would want to have the latest model. So by now everyone wants more stuff, but can they afford it? Well, we address that problem with consumer credit. Consume now, pay later. Okay, all's well and good, right? As this is happening, we're getting used to the idea that there will always be more of us. At the start of the fossil fuel revolution, there were fewer than one billion human beings on planet Earth. In the last few decades, we've been adding a billion human beings every dozen years or so. So not only is per capita consumption increasing, but so is the number of capitas. Again, all well and good, until we get up to the 1970s, and then some things start to change. For one thing, we, 
we get the first clue that maybe this can't go on forever. A team of scientists at MIT programmed a computer with data about population growth, resource depletion, uh, and environmental impacts. And the computer spat out a series of scenarios for how the, might, how the future might unfold. The most pessimistic of those scenarios, the business as usual scenario, showed a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first decades of the 21st century. Now, this study was written up as a book called The Limits to Growth, which was published in 1972. I read it when it came out. I was 21 years old at the time. It changed my life. I realized for the first time in my young existence that the world was on an unsustainable course. It's really why I'm standing in front of you right now. Some other things started happening in the 1970s. The pace of economic expansion in the US started to slow. Now, by this time, most Americans already had a car, a TV, air conditioner, washing machine, and so on. It's not as though innovation went away. In fact, in some ways, it went into warp drive with the computer and cell phone revolutions, but these new technologies, as amazing as they were, didn't create as much economic growth as electrification and the introduction of automobiles had in previous decades. Another thing that was happening starting in the 70s and then in the 80s, computerized monitoring of inventory, satellite communications, and container shipping enabled globalization. So now American factory workers were competing directly with workers on the other side of the planet. This had the effect of suppressing wage growth. So now everybody wants more, but they don't have the increasing salaries in real terms to buy much more unless they work more hours or go deeper into debt. So they did both things. The financial industry helped out with new innovations, credit cards, student loans, subprime mortgages. And so starting in the 1970s, total debt in the US begins growing at three times the pace of GDP growth. This results in, you know, with all of this new credit and debt, results in the explosion of the financial industry in comparison with all the other components of the economy. It's growing faster than agriculture or manufacturing, you name it. So that, in turn, results in a series of financial bubbles and ultimately a crisis. In 2008, <laughs> Americans stopped borrowing and spending as much. And President Bush realized that if we were going to keep the economy from imploding or deflating, we'd have to loosen up some money. And we're still doing that with nearly $100 billion a month in federal government deficit spending and Federal Reserve quantitative easing. Meanwhile, the energy picture is changing. Remember, it was energy that fueled all of this furious growth to start with. Well, 10 years ago, oil cost $25 a barrel. Today, it costs more like $100 a barrel. The oil companies are drilling twice as many wells and investing twice as much capital to produce the same amount of product. The environmental impacts of fossil fuel extraction are also soaring. We're drilling in thousands of feet of ocean water or destroying boreal forests to produce tar sands or fracking impermeable rocks under farmland and suburban neighborhoods in order to produce shale gas. And the environmental consequences of burning fossil fuels are also increasing rapidly. The North Polar ice cap has lost half its mass already. It could be gone completely in just a few years. Meanwhile, the oceans are absorbing increasing amounts of CO2, which makes them more acid, and that's undermining the very base of the global food chain. So here we are. We are seeing the limits to growth unfold all around us 
in real time. In fact, when I was in Australia last year, I had the opportunity to meet Graham Turner, one of that country's foremost scientists. He had done a retrospective analysis of that 1972 computer modeling study, and he found that the most pessimistic scenario, the business as usual scenario, was actually very close to correctly modeling the last 40 years of data trends. Somehow, mainstream economists fail to get all of this. They tell us that we can never run out of any resource because we can always substitute it with another resource. But here's the thing, of the top 15 non-renewable natural resources, only one, bauxite for aluminum, is not showing economic signs of scarcity. We're running out of substitutes. Here's the good news, though. It's not extracting more and more raw materials and energy from the environment that makes us happy. It's the quality of our relationships, our sense of continuity between past and future generations, our connection with our our, the people around us. That's what makes us, that's what makes life worthwhile. We can have more of those things without degrading the planet that we live upon. Further, every community already has the elements of a new post-carbon economy, whether it's farmers markets or community credit unions that invest locally. There are a, there's a new breed of economists that is exploring how economies can operate within Earth's natural limits in perpetuity. Manufacturers are experimenting with biomimicry, refashioning industry around the principles that characterize healthy ecosystems. There's an effort afoot at the United Nations to abandon GDP as a measure of economic well-being in favor of GNH, gross national happiness, So here's the question. Will we build a renewable energy infrastructure to support a steady state economy? Or will we try to pursue a Beverly Hillbillies lifestyle in a Hunger Games world? Everything depends on our turning off the commercials. Slow down, plant a garden, Take your money out of the big bank, put it in your local credit union. Reduce your energy consumption and install solar. Drive less, walk more. Get to know your neighbors. If we share what we have and we celebrate together the miracle of our humanity, we can have more of what really counts. Thank you. <laughs>